Hi everybody, this is Brendan Baylod. I am a Great Lakes uh, antiquarian, uh, meaning that I'm a book collector. I also collect um, antiquarian maps, charts, and ephemera uh, related to Great Lakes history. Uh, it can be anything from uh, shipwrecks and uh, regional history to uh, the age of exploration, uh, 1600s, 1700s. And uh, one of the things that I, uh, I specifically do is I restore uh, archival materials related to the Great Lakes. Um, and uh, I've been doing it for quite some time, so it's not something that I just picked up you know, recently. Uh, I've been doing it for about 15 years, I guess, on and off. And I've also had some training, so it's not something that I blundered into, uh, per se. I'm going to talk a little bit about t tonight about sort of um, uh, some of the considerations with book restoration. And I'm going to use this fairly rare Thompson's Coast Pilot as an example. Um, I'll go through what I do when I get in a book and make decisions about restoring it and, and, and how best to restore it. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about the background of this particular book. And, um, and then uh, I'll talk about what I plan to do with this one. I may make some additional videos uh, depending upon how it turns out. This is going to be a tough restoration. It's also a valuable book. Um, for those of you who know about Great Lakes Maritime history, you'll know that Coast Pilot books were very important in the uh, 1800s um, because there weren't uh, really any nautical charts. The U.S. Lake Survey didn't start until the 1840s didn't finish until the 1880s, and that was just maps. They didn't really have any textual references for you know, how to approach a harbor, where what its light, where its lighthouse was, what side of the harbor was its lighthouse on. You know That changed all the time. New harbors were springing up every few years in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. So these coast pilot books were really important. Um, there were three different competing coast pilots, Thompson's, Barnett's, and then later Scott's coast pilot. This is the earliest Thompson's Coast Pilot I own. Uh, it was started in uh, 1858 and uh, folded up in 1882. Um, this particular one is 1865, so right at the close of the Civil War this book came out. It's uh, quite old and um, quite valuable. These Coast Pilots are fetching, you know, well, what do I say fetching? Asking about $1,000 a piece right now on the uh, collector's market. They rarely... Uh, see that much money, but that's what they're asking. Um, I own uh, eight different Coast Pilots from the 19th century, uh, Thompson's, Barnett's, and Scott's. And all of them have been in rough shape when I've gotten them, and so each one of them has had these sort of, you know, restoration challenges. Um, I'll walk through what's wrong with this one, and then we'll talk about um, kind of what we do. So when I when I get a new book in, the first thing I do is I, I look it over and I go through all the different pages. Um, what I want to find is things of provenance. I want to see if there's anything that will add to the value of the book. So right away you'll see that the cover is disbound from this book. This is due to acidification, right? But there's a name on the cover, and I can't quite make it out. And I will probably... I will probably take that and uh, scan it. And I may do some analysis on that to see if I can uh, turn up some of the ink that's underneath there. I'm um, using some different filters on it. I'll see if I can find out whose name that is. Um, the other thing that I do is I go through every page. And I want to see if there's any writing. Uh, a lot of those things that identify individual people really make the item more interesting. You see the first leaf is disbound here. Um, this happens, uh, this is very badly acidified, you can see because it's brittle. Um, this paper isn't so bad on the inside, but on the edges it's brittle from being touched by people's hands. And that's caused, um, you know, uh, acidification just from, you know, people's fingers just brushing over it constantly. Um, I have washed my hands quite a bit before handling this, so the lanolin and the, and the acids on my hands are probably not real heavy right now. Uh, they're pretty clean. Um, I would say, too, that um, if this was a $10,000 book from the 1500s, I would be gloved. But because this is uh, probably really a $500 book from the 1800s, I'm not too leery about handling these without gloves, provided that my hands are washed, and I wash them just right before I come in and handle, so. All right, so we look through the book, and, you know, it seems pretty solid inside, although, wait, what's this? Ah, this is called a signature, where a group of pages are put together, and this whole signature 
is essentially free and somewhat disbound. So that's something to note. As we go through, we'll see uh, there's no writing or uh, anything pressed in the pages. I found money pressed in pages before. <laughs> Not a lot, but... Okay, what I'm starting to see is that there is some separation in the book. Here, you see it. So the book has fallen open, and where it's fallen open is where there's a crack down the middle of the of the spine, and I'll show you that later when I get to that. Um, and there's a few other places where the signatures are starting to spring loose. Um, so the binding is barely holding up, just barely. And of course, the reason why these things ask a lot of money is partially because they have a lot of interesting information about the harbors and the early port towns on the Great Lakes as they were back in the day. But also, these ads are really pretty cool. <laughs> Um, a lot of ship, shipyards, a lot of sailmakers, uh, J.W. Hall, the marine reporter at Detroit was pretty well known, um, ship chandleries, and the like. So, um, again, we can see here, you're, you're starting to see these little um, strands here. Um, this book is, there are two kinds of bindings that are common. There's what we know or know as case binding and bound in, being bound in boards. If something is case bound, it is uh, bound with its boards, you know, and, and end papers holding it in. If something is bound in boards, it's it's stitched. There's, there's not stitched, but there's these big strands of thread holding the boards to the book. So um, that's all that's holding this down. Um, there are a couple of ways to deal with that and strengthen this, which I'll talk about. Here, what we see is that the spine has split down the middle. You see that big split there where the, where the book opens up and it's split, right? And if we look over here, the backboard's not off, but it's pretty close. Um, we can see that it's definitely uh, missing some material, I think. If we push that down, we'll see that it doesn't quite line up. So that has flaked off. All right. And lastly, a rodent has taken to it and uh, removed a little bit of material, probably for its nest. Um, so, going through this book, I see, I want to check and find out more about the provenance on it. I'd like to see who owned it. We also, I saw earlier, have some writing on the book. Uh, in here, there's a, what appears to be a name right there, or at least some initials that may be related to this signature here. All right, this book needs um, essentially to be refastened. It also needs some cosmetic work. Now, uh, in, you know, antiquarian books, you, know, you don't want to get carried away with the cosmetic work. It should have a patina. It should look old. But we get it. We have to make this book stable so it can be handled. And uh, how do we do that? Well. The first thing I do with a book like this is I remove the parts that are loose and I set those aside. Here we can see that there's some things cracking away. Um, I might consider taking this signature off. It, it's only being held by one thread. Um, although it does seem to hold, be holding it on there. Maybe I'll leave it for now. Um, the main... Th oh, one other thing that's interesting on this book that you can just see here is that it has a small piece of the original uh, title label on it. I have never seen title label on one of these books before, ever. And it's interesting, it's beautiful blue with gilt, and it probably at one time said Thompson's Coast Pilot on it. Uh, it's this little blue sliver here. I'm going to try to save that, just so it shows for posterity. Um, but those almost never survive um, in these books. So, anyway, what do we what do? We do? to refasten this book. Um, uh, in the past, what a lot of libraries in public collections would do is they would rebind something like this in a library binding. So they would just slap it between some new boards and throw out the original boards, which are, <laughs> frankly, a big part of the value of the book. And they would uh, that would destroy the collectible value of the book. Rebinding this makes it worth about, you know, maybe $50, $100. Um, what I do 
is I use uh, an archival PVA glue like uh, Jade 403. What this does is it dries with a, like a, almost like a leather or a vinyl. And so I can put this into the spine. It will hold those disbound pages back in place. It'll really um, just tighten up the whole binding. I can bind these pages back in. Um, mm, it, what's important when you do that when you, is you have to act pretty quickly because it dries fairly quickly. So I have to plan this out. I'm going to put glue into the hinge, probably in the middle. I'm going to open the book up and I'm going to impregnate the split with glue in there. And you have to be careful when you do that, you have to put wax paper in between the pages. If you don't and glue accidentally gets on the page and then you open it, it'll tear, you know, uh, the edge of the pages as you open the book. So you have to be careful about that. Um, I'm probably going to um, put glue um, in here, and I, I apply it with a toothpick. Uh, that's the best way to apply Jade 403, if you want to be careful about it, is to take a toothpick and just work it in to these surfaces where you need it. Work it into these gaps here. Then what I do is I press the book. So I'll have this, um, once it's glued, I'll press it between uh, you know two heavier books, probably, um, so that it holds its shape. And I'll let it dry, usually overnight. And that'll uh, tighten it right back up. So, once the book is tightened back up, I'll do some more things cosmetically. I'll probably glue this down. I'll glue this down, these little you know, pieces that are turned upward. And uh, then I will start tipping in these pages. And I will glue this board back on with PVA glue. Uh, that shouldn't be too hard to do. I'll tip this in, this page, with a little PVA glue right on, this, right on the edge. Just a little bit. What you do is you uh, just feather it on with a brush, with a small paintbrush, like this one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that, I'm just going to feather PVA glue just under the edge. To put this board back on, it's a similar technique. I'm going to feather PVA glue onto this edge here, and then I'll set it down here. And then what I'll do after I get that feathered in, this isn't lining up very well. Obviously, if I was really gluing this, I would be doing it one piece at a time. Um, so you can see that lines up pretty well, actually. I'm also going to apply glue on the outside here, right underneath here. Now, that's going to show. You're going to see this shiny PVA glue through here. What I may do is I may use Japanese Kozo paper. It's a paper made out of mulberry. And I may make a small, two small strips, one here and one here. And I may glue that over. And I may also put some Kozo down here to cover that and a little Kozo up here to cover that. Japanese Kozo paper works really well. It won't take on that texture. That texture is going to be almost impossible to do. One other option I have, instead of using Kozo paper on these areas that are just exposed now, um, I'm loath to do it, but what I have done is taken a black watercolor marker, or a brown, because this isn't truly black anymore, and go over that. And what that does is it keeps your eye from noticing it. It fools your eye. You can be, you know, six inches from it and not even notice that the material's missing if it's colored well. Um, I may try that as well. That's a little bit of a cheaper repair than the Kozo paper, but it also sometimes is more effective, because if I use Kozo paper on here, you're going to see it because the texture is different. It's going to draw your eye pretty heavily, actually. So it's something to think about, whether I want to use Kozo paper or whether I want to just color it. And I want to be clear, if this was, again, a $10,000 book, we wouldn't be talking about using watercolor and, and doing this. We would be talking about you know, maybe taking an imprint of this texture and making an actual facsimile uh, to cover these, you know, with, with the same texture. Uh, people do that, uh, real, uh, you know, professional conservators in labs that make lots of money for doing it. So, that's the plan. Um, it's probably going to take me just one night to do this. Actually, two. Because I'll fasten it one night and glue it and press it. And then the next night I'll come and do the cosmetic repairs. 
Um, the end result will be that this book will be completely put back together. You'll be able to handle it. You'll be able to open it. You know, um, it'll open up naturally. You won't have to worry about things falling out or about it flaking anymore. Um, now, one other thing I could do that I want to mention. Um, uh, this acidification that we see here, where it's really chipping and brittle, right? Um, I could use Filmoplast P adhesive. This is a tape. It's very thin. I mean, like rice paper thin. It's it's uh, so thin that if you if you t rub it between your fingers just a little, you'll tear it. You know, it's hard to work with. You, I'm pretty good with it. I've used it for many years. I could take a very small small piece of um, filmoplast and put it uh, over these tears and over some of these tears. And what that'll do is stabilize this paper uh, so that when you handle it and, f and, and, and flip through it, it won't f just flake off. Um, the filmoplast will will protect it and keep it from going any further. I, I think I probably will use filmoplast on that. Um, this is an archival quality uh, uh, mending tape. It's uh, actually fairly expensive. I like to use it sparingly. All right. And so that should uh, make this a really nice addition to my collection that I can take and show people and uh, people can uh, handle and use for research. Um, if anybody has any questions about this, feel free to contact me. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or on Facebook, my contact information should be there. I am also willing to consult on, uh, on your books if you think that uh, you have a book that um, could uh, benefit from some restoration. So I hope you enjoyed this short uh, um, walk through um, how to assess a book for restoration. Have a nice evening.